Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery. This week I've got a mystery for you with a bit of a difference. It's one week after the 9-11 attacks on the 11th of September 2001. The entirety of America was in disbelief as to what had happened just days earlier. New York and the government were barely beginning to pick up the pieces of the tragedy. When you think of September 2001, you think of the Twin Towers falling but you don't think about the 2001 anthrax attacks that happened just one week later. The official FBI case name is Amerithrax and it was one of the largest and most complex FBI investigations in history. Now before I really get into this video I should probably explain what exactly anthrax is otherwise you'll be a little bit confused throughout this. So anthrax is a disease which is caused by a bacteria called this on the screen. Um, and this particular bacteria can survive in the environment by forming spores. Anthrax, the word anthrax itself, is Greek for coal and it so gets its name because of the dark sores it can form on the skin. Now there are three different types of anthrax. There's cutaneous anthrax which is when the spores get into your system through an open cut or abrasion on the skin. This is when it forms these dark sores, headaches, fever and vomiting. Then there's gastrointestinal anthrax which is usually when somebody's eaten infected meat um, and it causes very similar symptoms to food poisoning. And then the most severe form of anthrax is called pulmonary anthrax. This is caused when a person is directly exposed to a large number of anthrax spores. They breathe in the spores and it initially causes symptoms pretty similar to that of a common cold or a flu but it rapidly progresses into very severe breathing difficulties and shock sometimes causing meningitis. Now the good news is that anthrax does respond well to antibiotic treatment but it's all about getting that treatment quickly, it's about diagnosing the anthrax. There is an anthrax vaccine but it's not very widely used, it's mostly given to people in the military and people who are working directly in labs with anthrax. All in all, anthrax is pretty rare in the Western world, but it is still fairly common in the developing world. And the spores can remain dormant in soil for years and years and years before they eventually find their way into a host. And the host is usually livestock rather than a human. Anthrax has been blamed for many epidemics throughout history, but it actually emerged in World War I as a biological weapon. You see, it only takes a very small amount of anthrax to infect a very large amount of people. The spores are so small that you can't see, smell them, or taste them. It's a perfect biological weapon. Anonymous letters laced with deadly anthrax spores began arriving at media companies and congressional offices on the 18th of September 2001. This would lead all in all to the death of five people and 17 other people getting infected, although it's thought that the number could be a lot higher than this. And um, these letters were all postmarked from Trenton, New Jersey. The first load of letters started to appear on the 18th September. Five separate letters were posted to news outlets across New York and one in Florida. There's ABC News, CBS News, MBS News and the New York Post, all based in New York City. And the National Enquirer are based at the American Media Inc. offices in Boca Raton in Florida. Now when these letters first arrived, people were opening them, finding this weird substance and thinking nothing more of it, usually just disposing of the letter and this weird powder. And it was only two weeks later, on the 4th of October 2001, over two weeks after the letters were first postmarked, health officials in Florida announced that a man called Robert Bob Stevens, who was a tabloid photo editor at American Media Inc, had been diagnosed with pulmonary anthrax, the most serious form of anthrax. Um, this was the first case in the USA in over 25 years, and this was big news. But it wasn't suggested at first that this was any form of terrorism. It was actually suggested at first that it was entirely natural. Bob had been to North Carolina the week before, he'd been drinking water out of the streams, and it's thought that he picked up through this water. Like I said, pulmonary anthrax symptoms start out as similar to that of the common cold or flu. So originally Bob's condition was just put down to a bad bout of the flu. But he ends up going to hospital on the 1st of October with vomiting and shortness of breath. He died four days later on October 5th. 
Um, Bob was originally diagnosed in hospital with pneumonia and then meningitis. It never once crossed the doctor's minds that this could be anthrax. Like I said, anthrax had been seen in the USA in over 25 years. They weren't trained in how to spot the symptoms and they never really would have to know how to spot the symptoms of anthrax. It was only once Bob's cultures were sent to an infectious disease specialist who analysed it and found the rod-shaped bacteria of anthrax. Did they realise it was something a little bit more serious? Um, this specialist notifies the health department and only then do they get the true diagnosis for Bob of anthrax. And although, like I said, anthrax does respond well to antibiotics, it was a little bit too late at this point. Shortly after, two of Bob's co-workers also fall ill with very similar symptoms and this sparks a search of the building. They find anthrax spores everywhere, particularly loads on Bob's keyboards. Other reports of similar cases start to appear at media outlets throughout New York City and the authorities start to ask questions. And it doesn't take long to discover a running theme throughout Victim. Almost all of those infected in New York City had been in direct contact with letters containing a very mysterious powder. But only the letters from the New York Post and the NBC News were found. The existence of the other three letters, including the one of Florida, are just inferred by the people who were saying they opened letters and saying that this weird powdery material fell out. Scientists examined the New York Post letter and said that the anthrax appeared as coarse brown granular material, similar to that of dog food. This brown material mostly caused skin affections, a cutaneous form of anthrax. In nine out of the 12 original cases, it was cutaneous anthrax rather than the pulmonary anthrax, which is what Bob died of. By October 15th, the crisis reaches Washington, D.C., when an anthrax letter is opened in the office of Democratic Senator Tom Daschle. Now, this letter was once again postmarked from Trenton, New Jersey, and was dated the 9th of October. Now, the senator didn't open the letter himself. It was actually opened by an aide called Grant Leslie on October 15th. At this point, the authorities were obviously already aware of these anthrax letters being posted, so they acted a lot more quickly when they were told. Leslie wasn't the only one to be affected by this particular letter, though, as several workers at the postal facility which would have processed this letter also fell ill with pulmonary anthrax. And because of this, the government mail service was shut down and all congressional buildings were closed for a while. During a search of all the halted quarantined mail, another anthrax letter was found, this time to Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy. This brought the total letters to four physical letters that the authorities had, but seven letters in all. There were five letters in the first wave to media outlets and only two in the second wave to the congressional offices. Um, whilst the anthrax sent to the media was always this coarse brown material, the, the anthrax sent to the congressional offices was actually a very fine white powder, similar to talcum powder. It originally starts out as a public health response, but doesn't take long for law enforcement to get involved. Someone is deliberately sending anthrax through the US mail system, putting not only the recipients at risk, but also the postal workers handling the mail. The postal system is entirely halted as 280 barrels of unopened mail is collected and searched. These 280 quarantined letters were from the same postal facility that handled the congressional letters and the primary concern of the entire operation was safety. They didn't want anyone else to fall ill. Everyone in this containment area with all these barrels of letters had to wear protective personal equipment, masks, goggles, respirators and all of this mail had to be sampled and sorted. This was a huge undertaking. As well as searching for the anthrax within these letters though, the scientists also had to ensure that if there was anthrax in this containment building, that wasn't going to leave the building and therefore they had to put in special filters to filter any anthrax out of the air. You had to be really careful about what you were wearing when you walked into the facility and like you have to take things off when you walked out of it. It was a huge undertaking, but instead of having to physically look at each and every single letter, they analysed the bags, the barrels of letters instead, checking for spores within the barrels, and if it was found that there were spores in the barrels, then they would further search that barrel. They just kept narrowing it down from there until they eventually found the letter to Patrick Leahy. Curiously, possibly as a very knee-jerk reaction to the anthrax attacks, the FBI and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention both gave permission for the Iowa State University to destroy the entire 
Iowa anthrax archives. All of this anthrax that was held by Iowa State University was destroyed on the 10th and 11th of October 2001. They had more than 100 vials of anthrax kept in the university in Ames, Iowa. All of the anthrax destroyed in this was the same strain of anthrax that was used in the attacks and, and just seems strange that the FBI would want these destroyed rather than further protected. Many scientists say that this quick destruction of the anthrax in Iowa eliminated crucial evidence for the investigation. A precise match between the strains would have offered hints as to when this particular bacteria was isolated and how widely it was distributed to the researchers but instead the FBI ordered for all this anthrax to be destroyed. There are a lot of conspiracies around this suggesting that the FBI are trying to cover something up Personally, I think it was just a split second decision. Anthrax out in the open, you've got loads of anthrax, destroy it so this can't happen again. But maybe I'm just thinking a little bit positively there. By the end of November 2001, it seemed like the anthrax attacks had run its course. No additional letters have been found since the middle of October. In total, 22 people were infected with either cutaneous or pulmonary anthrax, and five of those people had died all of whom had suffered from the pulmonary form of the disease. The victims were Bob Stevens, Thomas Morris Jr, Joseph Kersin and Thomas and Joseph were both employees of the Brentwood Mail Facility in Washington DC, Kathy Wynn and 94 year old Attili Lundgren. Now it's not actually known how Kathy and Attili contracted this anthrax but it's widely thought to be linked because it happened at the same time. Neither of them received anthrax letters themselves, they didn't live near the media buildings, it was a bit of a mystery and anthrax is so rare that it's highly unlikely that they just happened to contract it at the same time. Um, Kathy was a Vietnamese immigrant who lived in the Bronx but worked in New York City. Attili was actually the widow of a prominent judge and she lived in Oxford, Connecticut, so nowhere near. The only possible explanation is that they had received letters themselves that had been in contact with the anthrax letters and the spores had leaked through the envelope. It's also interesting to note that none of the intended recipients were ever infected. It was always somebody else who opened the letter rather than the intended person. As a result of the anthrax tax, congressional buildings were closed for many, many months and postal facilities in Washington DC, New Jersey and Connecticut didn't reopen for over a year, as well as the American Media Inc. building in Florida. It cost tens of millions of dollars to decontaminate these buildings. But alongside that as well, there's the monetary cost of disrupting the postal services. And you've got to remember as well that all of this was happening on the backdrop of the 9-11 attacks. People were already panicked, already scared, and the anthrax attacks were just an additional thing to be worried about. Any bioterrorist attack is going to produce this climate of uncertainty and insecurity. And people got really scared and they started to self-diagnose themselves with the symptoms of anthrax. So as well as everything else, the health services suddenly found themselves very overwhelmed as well with people coming in claiming that they were dying of anthrax when they weren't. And this wasn't really anything the authorities have had to deal with before. The government had been preparing for some sort of bioterrorist attack for many, many years, but they had many shortcomings in it and they were very aware that they had their shortcomings in dealing with the bioterrorist acts. They just thought they'd have longer to learn how to do things correctly and the anthrax attacks just happened out of nowhere. It points out a lot of weaknesses to the government. There was weakness in communication, there was weakness in knowing exactly whose area it was to deal with each thing, there were weaknesses in the US healthcare system, and it was just a bit of a mess. In the initial aftermath of the attacks, there was a lot of confusion as to whose agency's job it was to deal with it. Public health, state agencies, federal agency, whose job was it to deal with this? And eventually the FBI took over and began the process of attempting to identify the perpetrators. But because of all this confusion in the early days, there were actually a lot of mistakes made, mainly because people just weren't prepared for it. Um, they failed to evacuate the AMI building for many days, which led to two other people in the building getting ill. They initially failed to make the link to the anthrax attacks in New York. They failed to test the Brentwood Postal Facility because they assumed that because the letters were very well sealed, the anthrax wouldn't have been able to get out. Um, it could It could leak through the pores in the envelope. It was just something that nobody was prepared for, but once the authorities did figure out what was going on, 
then they started to act quickly and they probably saved many more lives because they suddenly kicked into gear and started testing and started giving out antibiotics. They had to get the word out across the country that anthrax was something that they now had to watch out for. Very few physicians had ever had to deal with anthrax before. Between 1900 and 1978 there were only 18 reported cases of pulmonary anthrax across the entire country and then none since 1978. Now I've spoken at length about the anthrax found in the envelopes but I haven't actually spoken about the letters that came along with them. Um, the New York Post and the NBC newsletters contained the following note. I saw that the other three letters sent to media companies would have contained the same note as well. It's dated 091101. This is next. Take penicillin now. Penicillin is misspelt. Death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. Now the fact that this says take penicillin now is telling. This is warning the recipient that they need to go and take antibiotics. Actually, everything about the letter and the envelope seems like whoever sent this was trying to avoid anyone actually getting hurt apart from the intended recipient. These letters were folded with a pharmaceutical fold, which is a fold that's been used for centuries to safely contain and transport powder medicines, suggesting that whoever sent this was knowledgeable about things such as pharmaceutical folds. Um, the envelopes were also taped up multiple times to ensure the anthrax would not be able to escape. Whoever sent this clearly didn't realise that the anthrax would be able to escape through the pores in the envelope. The second note sent in the second wave to the senators read 091101, you cannot stop us, we have this anthrax, you die now, are you afraid? Death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great. Now this letter actually has punctuation unlike the letters sent to the media outlets and this one also came with a return address. Um, only the return address was entirely fictional. And the return address was 4th grade Greendale School, Franklin Park, NJ 08852. Now Franklin Park does exist but it's in a different zip code to the zip code put on the envelope. Um, the zip code is for somewhere called Monmouth Junction. There's also no Greendale School within either of these places but there is one adjacent to South Brunswick, also in New Jersey. It seems to me personally that whoever wrote this is most likely from New Jersey because they knew enough random places to throw together this random address. People analysed every single aspect of these letters, including the fact that the letters A and T were sometimes bolded or highlighted. Um, according to the FBI, this suggests that some of the letters may have contained some kind of hidden code, but as far as I'm aware, they've never been able to decipher any actual code from this. Um, all of the letters were copies made from a copy machine. None of the original letters were ever found. I um, mean, each letter was cut to a different size. Investigators searched this kind of area of New Jersey in detail. They tested over 600 mailboxes for anthrax. Out of 600 mailboxes, only one tested positive for the anthrax. And this was located at 10 Nassau Street, which is located very near the Princeton University campus. Therefore, they believe that it's this letterbox from which the letters were mailed. By this point, the FBI Amerithrax investigation is in full swing. It's a long investigation. They have many, many different leads to look into. Narrowing down the anthrax to a potential letterbox was a huge step forward in this case, possibly the biggest step in this case. And it wasn't all that difficult to narrow it down. But from there, it was difficult. They knew that whoever was mailing these letters probably wasn't using their local letterbox to do so. They were probably traveling from a while out to actually get to this letterbox. And to add fuel to the fire, now people had heard about these anthrax attacks and thought it would be hilarious to start sending fake hoax letters across the USA. The FBI had that to deal with as well as the actual investigation. And people across the USA were also really suspicious about anthrax letters being received. So any slightly suspicious letter was being reported, adding more work to the FBI. So who were the suspects here and why would somebody want to do this in the first place? Now, considering this happened a week after the 9-11 attacks, the first place people went was to the same people that did the 9-11 attacks. Even President George Bush said of the attacks, we have no hard data yet, but it's clear that Bin Laden is a man who is an evil man. I wouldn't put it past them. He and his spokesmen are bragging about how they hope to inflict more pain on our country. 
All in all, I don't think it was absolutely crazy to assume that the people who did the 9-11 attacks were also responsible for the anthrax attacks. And they were both acts of terrorism at the end of the day. However, Robert Mueller, who was the FBI director at the time, said, while organised terrorism has not been ruled out, so far we have found no direct link to organised terrorism. And it seems that Mueller actually paid the price for this because the president and his team were desperate for Mueller to prove there was the work of Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. They wanted to blame somebody in the Middle East for this. They didn't want it to be domestic. They didn't want an American to be attacking their own people. But the FBI knew really, really early on that the kind of anthrax that was used in these attacks was very, very sophisticated. It would need very sophisticated equipment to produce this level of anthrax and the FBI knew it was highly, highly unlikely that Al-Qaeda had access to this level of equipment. But of course this information wasn't immediately made public by the FBI and the media went crazy, speculating time and time again that this anthrax, this particular strain of anthrax, came from Iraq. It was suggested again and again and again by the media that bentonite was used as an ingredient in this anthrax, which implicated Iraq again, because Iraq used this particular additive, bentonite, when they were producing their biochemical weapons. It was a trademark of Saddam Hussein. Despite officials coming out and saying that basically this was rubbish, there was no bentonite in this anthrax, no single trace of it, um, the conservative news outlets insisted for many, many years that because there was bentonite in this anthrax, then it was definitely, definitely the work of Al-Qaeda, but it just simply wasn't true. And it's dangerous to spread that kind of information, especially in the wake of 9-11, to insist that it was foreigners who were doing this when actually the likelihood was that the anthrax was domestic. This anthrax came from America. The FBI worked the case hard, they exhausted every single lead to discern whether the September 11 attacks and the anthrax attacks were connected. They eventually concluded that they were not, but of course this didn't stop people speculating. And of course with the letters saying death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great, I can see why people would maybe assume that the letters came from Iraq, came from Al-Qaeda, but it's very highly likely as well that an American could just write these words to incite more fear. And this is where we're gonna to begin to get a little bit sciency. So all of the anthrax was derived from the same bacterial strain known as the Ames strain, um, which is a common strain isolated from a cow in 1981. Now there's a bit of confusion, they thought this cow came from Ames, Iowa, but instead it came from Texas, but regardless, the anthrax strain was called the Ames strain. Now this particular strain of anthrax was first researched at the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease in Maryland. And then this strain was distributed to 16 bio-research labs within the US and three other locations, Canada, Sweden, and the UK. And therefore it's highly, highly unlikely that anybody outside of these particular facilities would have access to this particular strain of anthrax. The anthrax used in every single one of these letters was Ames anthrax. Radiocarbon dating of the anthrax concluded that it was cultured no more than two years before the attacks. The authorities travelled to six different continents, they interviewed over 9,000 people, issued over 600 subpoenas and conducted 67 full searches. They began to narrow down their suspects, taking note of anyone who would have had access to this Ames strain of anthrax. Not everyone in the world has access to anthrax spores, let alone this particular strain. So they're actually looking at a very narrow, very specific group of people in connection with this. Now one person's name who was brought up time and time again was Stephen Hatfield, and his name was brought up after claims from a woman called Barbara Hatch Rosenberg. She said that the mailings might be the work of a rogue CIA agent. She was an anti-nuclear, anti-biological warfare activist, and after she learned that it was specifically the Ames strain used, she said that she had knowledge of specific people who might be involved. She spoke relentlessly about her belief that she knew who did it. She held talks, she spoke to the media, she spoke to anyone who would listen to her. She said it was Stephen Hatfill. And after a lot of pressure from Barbara and from the public, the FBI did eventually search Stephen's house in June 2002. They searched it with his permission, of course. 
and the FBI make it clear at this time that he is not a suspect. Um, Stephen Hatfield was an American physician and biological weapons expert. He was a former biodefense researcher for the Institute of Infectious Diseases. Barbara argued that Stephen was a prime suspect because he had knowledge of anthrax and he had potential access to it. He was very familiar with the method of weaponizing anthrax and Barbara said that he is not an all person, saying that he had a very long history of erratic behaviour. She believed that he had had some kind of career setback and this caused him to become depressed and angry, causing him to retaliate and send out this anthrax to show how good he really was at his job. But also, she said, he wanted to get the government to invest more money in bioweapon research, which was his particular field. Now, despite that the FBI said this time that Stephen Hatfield was not a suspect, once the media got wind of the fact that the FBI had searched his apartment, he becomes a household name across America. And then officially in August, he is labelled a person of interest. And he's labelled this in a press conference by the Attorney General, although no charges were made whatsoever. Um, Stephen denies having anything to do with the attacks and he actually ended up suing the FBI for violating his constitutional rights and violating the Privacy Act. Over the years, his home and just his entire life would be searched by the FBI time and time again. Um, in 2003, he was actually being followed by an FBI agent and when he goes over to the FBI agent to like confront him, um, the agent actually runs his foot over and when the police arrive, they give Stephen Hatfield a violation for walking to create a hazard. Stephen does try to appeal this, but the courts uphold the fine and he ends up having to pay it. It was also later revealed that Stephen Hatfield had actually forged a PhD certificate when he was applying for jobs, which had very little to do with the actual attacks themselves, but was an attack on his personal character. The argument was that if he could lie on his resume, then what else was he lying about? I'd say lying on your resume and lying about killing five people, bit of a difference there. It was also announced by the New York Times that Stephen had received some anti-anthrax medication about a week before the attacks took place. The media ran with this. The medication was called ciprofloxacin um, and to them this was proof that he must be guilty. And it's true, ciprofloxacin can be used to treat anthrax but it can also be used to treat your sinuses and Stephen had recently had a sinus operation. He later sued the New York Times for making this claim. All in all, I really don't think there's enough on Stephen Hatfield to consider him an actual suspect in this case. Sure, he had a job that would allow him to do the anthrax attacks if he wanted to, he definitely, definitely had the knowledge, but I couldn't find anything that actually suggested to me that he was in any way guilty. I think the public were just looking for someone to blame, so they latched on. And of course, the FBI would have had a reason for naming him a suspect, like I'm sure they had their reasoning behind that, but it seems like they never actually found anything incriminating because they never arrested him. Hatfield was considered the main suspect in the case until 2006, when a new director took over at the FBI, and their attentions moved onto a man called Bruce Ivins. Bruce Ivins worked at the government's biodefense labs at Fort Detrick for 19 years, the same place that Stephen Hatfield worked, and he was a top biodefense researcher. Now he is the main name you'll find when you type in the anthrax attack suspects into Google. His name is just absolutely everywhere. He was a long time anthrax researcher at the US Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases and he's one of the very few people in the country who had access to the Ames strain of anthrax. He died on the 29th of July 2008 after being found unconscious in his home two days earlier. It was an apparent suicide, he'd taken an overdose of Tylenol with codeine and there was no autopsy required as a state medical examiner determined it wouldn't be necessary following his blood result. But then on August 6, 2008, just a week after his death, the FBI and the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia did something strange. He made a public statement disclosing all of the evidence they had on Bruce Ivins, something that was highly, highly unusual because of the whole innocent until proven guilty kind of thing. But they said that because the case had received significant public interest since his death, they thought the public deserved to know what was going on. And they basically said that Bruce Ivins been the sole suspect since 2007. In the weeks before his death, the FBI had had multiple conversations with Bruce's attorney regarding the investigation and the FBI basically told his attorneys that they believed they had enough evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and therefore Bruce was going to be arrested. 
The evidence they had is the following. So in early 2005, they were able to identify the genetically unique parent material of the anthrax used in the mailing. As the court documents say, the parent material of the anthrax spores used in the attacks was found in a single flask of spores known as RMR1029. Now that particular flask was created and solely maintained by Dr. Bruce Ivins. This means that the spores used in the attack were made from this specific flask that only Bruce Ivins had access to. No one received material from that flask without going through Dr. Ivins first. The FBI said they thoroughly investigated every single person who had access to the spores from that flask and the only person they couldn't rule out was Dr. Ivins. But the question is, would he have really been stupid enough to use anthrax from his own flask. He would have known it would be able to be traced back to him. There was also a specific machine which needed to be used when creating these anthrax spores found in the mailings. This machine is called a lyophilizer. I'm probably saying that very wrong. A lyophilizer is a sophisticated machine that is used to dry pathogens and it could be used to dry anthrax. And we know that other people in Dr. Ivan's labs could only use that machine when they spoke to him first. According to other people who work with him in the labs, they say that Bruce Ivins was working very strange and inordinate hours alone in the lab. He was working there early in the morning and late at night and he was in there alone at the weekends. When questioned by the FBI as to why he was in the lab during all of these strange hours, Dr. Ivins was unable to provide a response. Dr. Ivins also engaged in some very strange behaviour and made a number of statements that suggested consciousness of guilt. For example, one night shortly after a search warrant was executed on his house, Dr. Ivins took very strange steps to discard a book about DNA coding and at this point he was under 24-7 surveillance so they watched him do it. He also submitted a very questionable sample of anthrax to the FBI, presumably to mislead the investigators. And he also made far-reaching efforts to blame others. He made threatening emails to a friend about the case. He also told a therapist that he was going to kill the people who had wronged him. Dr. Ivins did have a history of mental health problems and he was facing a very difficult professional time in the summer before the anthrax mailings. Um, he was working on an anthrax vaccine that just kept failing and failing again and again. And the affidavit describes one email to a co-worker in which Dr. Ivins stated he had incredible paranoid delusional thoughts at times and he feared that he wasn't able to control his behaviour. Um, about a year before the attacks, Ivan's told a mental health counsellor that he was interested in a woman and that he'd mixed poison to give to her after he watched her at a soccer match. If she lost, he was going to poison her. Um, he emphasised to his therapist that he was a skillful scientist and that he could do things without people finding out. The counsellor at the time was actually so alarmed that she goes to the police and tells them but the police say they can't do anything about it because he didn't actually give the girl the poison. Dr Ivan's psychiatrist actually called him homicidal, sociopathic with clear intentions. Throughout his adult life Dr Ivan's would regularly send strange packages in the mail under fake names to disguise his identity. Apparently he would drive to very far locations to send these packages. And um, he also admitted to using false names and aliases in his writing. Um, in addition, he would constantly write letters to Congress and the media, which were the two targeted victims in the attack. When law enforcement first searched his house, they found 68 letters that he'd written to the media and to Congress, but hadn't sent. The envelopes used in the attack were all pre-franked envelopes, and they were sold only at the US post office during a nine-month window in 2001. An analysis on the envelopes revealed that there were many print defects on the envelopes and therefore they're able to narrow it down and conclude that these particular envelopes used in the mailings were likely sold from a post office in the greater Maryland area. From this they're able to narrow it down and conclude that these envelopes were most likely sold in the greater Frederick area in Maryland um, in 2001. Dr. Ivins maintained a post office box himself at this same post office. Over the course of the seven year investigation, Dr. Ivins was interviewed multiple times by the FBI and his statements were always inconsistent. However, there are questions about Ivins's guilt. There were over 100 people who over the years had access to this particular vial of anthrax 
through him, of course. Um, and the FBI could never place him anywhere near this particular mailbox in New Jersey. The FBI failed to find any trace of anthrax in his home, vehicle, or any of his belongings, and his colleagues refused to believe that he did it. And although the genetic origin of the spores came from this particular flask in Ivans' lab, the spores found in the flask did not have the same silicone chemical fingerprint as used in the attacks. They were very slightly different. The implication of this is that somebody had taken the spores out of the flask and then used these spores to grow new ones, suggesting that A, it was somebody with scientific knowledge and B, someone with access to this flask. Using the equipment in the lab at the time, at least a year of very intensive work would have been required to grow the spores used in the mailings. Such an intensive effort probably wouldn't have escaped the attention of Ivans' colleagues. And nobody ever saw anything, although he was working these very strange hours, nobody ever noticed him growing this huge amount of anthrax spores. It also suggested that Ivan's lab wasn't secure enough to stop these anthrax spores leaking out and nobody around this lab ever got ill. Some science magazines do suggest that this number of anthrax spores could be grown in a number of days by somebody who was knowledgeable enough. Um, but again, I don't think I believe the word of a science magazine over actual scientists. The chief of the bacteria division at the lab at the time said that in 2001, the lab simply lacked the equipment that was needed to make the kind of spores found in the letters. And this is something that in 2011, the government had to concede. So whilst Dr. Bruce Ivins is a very interesting suspect in this case, and had he survived, he probably would have been arrested and charged for these attacks, there are multiple questions surrounding his guilt, some of which you can't really get around. A lot of people suggest that this could have been carried out by right-wing extremists, um, something that Bruce was not. Had both the attacks succeeded in killing their senator targets, then the result would have been a Republican majority in the Senate. Right-wing extremists did have a reason for particularly targeting Democratic senators. But as far as I can tell, this is just a very loose theory. They've never been able to narrow it down any further than that. Although the FBI denied having any link to the 9-11 attacks whatsoever, despite the president very much wanting them to find a link there, um, there is one small question of one of the 19 9-11 hijackers. A man called Ahmed al-Haznawi has likely been exposed to anthrax before the attacks. Um, he basically arrived at the emergency room in Fort Lauderdale in Florida with a very dark lesion on his leg, which he said that he developed after bumping into a suitcase. Now at the time, it was treated with antibiotics and he was like told to go on his way but in hindsight it's thought this very dark sore on his leg may have been anthrax showing that he may have been exposed to the spores at some point but of course this can't be confirmed because now he's dead and it wasn't confirmed at the time um, several of the 9-11 hijackers actually lived in Boca Raton near the American Media Incorporation, which was the workplace of the first victim. But if it was the work of these 9-11 hijackers, then they would have required an accomplice because they were all mailed after the attacks had taken place and all mailed from New Jersey. But there's no answer as to how any of these hijackers would have been able to get their hands on this sophisticated type of anthrax. All in all, the anthrax attacks are still a mystery, although the FBI do believe that if Ivans had lived, he would have been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, even years after the attacks, several survivors still suffer with medical issues from the anthrax, shortness of breath, memory loss, and it is speculated that a lot more than 22 victims were infected. The number is thought to have been as high as 68. The concept of biological warfare, biological terrorism, is terrifying. The thought that any people with access to any of these diseases could just go out and infect possibly millions of people if they wanted to is a really scary thought. We've just got to trust that since the anthrax attacks, more barriers have been put in place to prevent this from happening. So like I said, a bit of a midweek mystery with a difference this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, let me know what other mysteries you would like to hear from me. Um, make sure you subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up if you'd like to see more. And thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.